Who are the Bitkovs? Irina and Igor Bitkov come from northwestern Russia. In the 1990s, as Russia lurched from communism to capitalism, they were among its early entrepreneurs. They saw the opportunity to redevelop old factories that produced paper. By 2007, they owned five factories and had 3,000 employees. In 2007, their company was valued at close to $430 million. It had the highest level of profitability in the sector. Of course, to invest in the business, they had borrowed money from several banks. The company had an impeccable credit history. The Bitkoffs were popular with the local population in the regions where they had their factories. Not only did they create jobs, they also offered unusually generous social programs. Their success did not go unnoticed by those in power. There were several offers to buy the company, but the Bitkoffs rejected them all. They were intent on further expanding the business. At the same time, they supported opposition candidates in municipal elections and refused to sponsor the Kremlin's new political party that was designed to reinforce Putin's grip on power. After Anastasia's kidnapping in 2007, further threats followed. By April 2008, the Bitkoffs concluded that it was no longer safe to stay in Russia. Within days, the Russian state banks that had made loans to the Bitkoffs' company froze its assets and demanded immediate repayment within 24 hours. The Bitkoffs did not have the funds to pay back $158 million of loans. Bankruptcy administrators were quickly on the scene and the Bitkoffs lost control of their business. Further threats followed. A call from a Kremlin official made it clear that if they did not return to Russia, the authorities would hunt them down. Fearing that the US and Europe still did not understand the nature of the Putin regime, the Bitkoffs looked further afield. They looked for a country that did not have an extradition treaty with Russia, where they could live far beyond the Kremlin's reach. Guatemala appeared to be a good option, since they had identified a law firm offering a legal route to obtain Guatemalan citizenship and the possibility to change their identities for protection. They arrived in Guatemala in 2009 and quickly received their documents. They settled down and began learning Spanish. In 2012, Irina gave birth to Vladimir. What they didn't know was that investigators from VTB, the Russian state bank, had tracked the Bitkoffs to Guatemala in 2013. The bank falsely claimed that the Bitkoffs had failed to repay a commercial loan. Gazprom Bank, another state bank that had made loans to the Bitkoffs company, persuaded CSIG, the powerful UN-sponsored anti-corruption agency in Guatemala, to investigate the Bitkoffs. But a case of this kind wasn't part of CSIG's mandate that focused on rooting out clandestine security organisations and other groups that had infiltrated state institutions and threatened Guatemala's democracy. In January 2015, 70 armed police swooped on the Bitkoff's house on the outskirts of Guatemala City and arrested Igor, Irina and Anastasia. They were placed in a cage in an underground car park below the main court building in Guatemala City and subjected to a horrifying denial of their rights. Deprived of water, food and sleep, they were kept for days in cells open to public view, where detainees are not supposed to spend more than 24 hours. Anastasia suffered a nervous breakdown and was taken to a hospital with Arena where they spent the next 12 months under prison guard. After nine days in the cage, Igor was put in pre-trial detention where he spent the next three and a half years. It turned out that the Bitkoff's documents were official but they had been illegally issued. The law firm had misled the family. In this situation, the family would normally have paid a fine and been allowed to leave the country. Instead, Guatemalan investigators claimed that the Bitkoffs were part of a criminal group operating in the passport office and put them on trial with a group of over 30 low-level officials. According to the testimony of a former director of the passport office, 5,000 people received passports in the same way as the Bitkoffs between 2009 and 2011. Yet, the Bitkoffs were the only ones to go on trial. The law firm was not investigated and continued to offer citizenship services. Before the trial, Guatemala's constitutional court had ruled that the Bitkoffs were migrants and were not criminally liable despite having incorrectly issued documents. 
But after VTB and CSIG appealed against the Constitutional Court decision, a first-instance court was able to go ahead with the trial while the appeal was pending. In April 2018, nearly four months after the sentencing of the Bitcoffs, the Constitutional Court reconfirmed its earlier decision. But the Bitcoffs stayed in jail and CSIG filed another appeal. It took a hearing in the U.S. Helsinki Commission in Washington in late April 2018 to bring the attention of the U.S. Congress to the plight of the Bitcoffs and Russian influence on CSIG. The Bitcoffs were quickly released from jail, where they had endured terrible conditions and placed under house arrest. They were reunited with Vladimir, who, after 42 days in an orphanage, had been allowed to live with one of the family's lawyers. The Bitcoffs were out of jail, but not out of the clutches of the Guatemalan legal system. In June 2018, the Constitutional Court reversed its previous decisions and allowed CSIC to prosecute the Bitcoffs for incorrectly obtaining driver's licences and credit cards. CSIG now pushed to retry Igor, while the Public Prosecutor's Office began a separate investigation into the Bitcoffs' affairs in response to a request from the Russian authorities based on a criminal investigation in Russia. In September 2018, the Guatemalan president, Jimmy Morales, announced that he would not extend CSIG's mandate beyond September 2019. A year later, CSIG was disbanded, and shortly afterwards, the government granted the Bitcoffs refugee status in Guatemala. Yet this decision did not end the family's nightmare. The Bitcoffs remained under house arrest, and in June 2020, the Court of Appeal upheld the sentences for Igor, Irina and Anastasia. Three and a half years later, the Bitcoffs are still under house arrest, and their fate is still in the balance. On October 26, 2023, four years after the Bitcoffs received refugee status and six years after the Constitutional Court decision establishing the Bitcoffs as migrants under the UN Palermo Protocols, the Supreme Court of Justice rejected Irina's and Anastasia's appeal, stating that they were not migrants and refugees. This means that both Irina and Anastasia can be returned to jail and sent back to Russia after serving their sentences. Irina and Anastasia have submitted appeals to the Constitutional Court. It's unclear when the court will rule. Guatemala is a country without rule of law. The politicisation of the judicial system means that the Bitcoffs could once again be in danger after the victory of the Semija party in the recent presidential election. A new government will take office in early 2024. As a Wall Street Journal columnist noted before the conclusion of the election, the Semija party is flush with political figures who endorse the state terror used against the Bitcoffs and many innocent Guatemalans. It's time for supporters of improved governance in Guatemala to recognise that the Bitcoffs are the victims of injustice in Russia that has been exported to a corrupt environment in Guatemala. It's time to release the Bitcoffs from their suffering and let them resume their lives.